Thank you, Cheyenne. Uh, like Paul, I come from what may be the last school of public health not to have someone's name on it. And, you know, I think, I think, I think Paul feels a little bad about this. So if you guys had like, oh, $100, you could get your name on the school. Uh, so I believe at the next break, we're going to raffle off naming opportunities to the school. So be prepared. Uh, before I dive into my remarks today, I want to say just a word about Bo Burt. Uh, for many reasons, I'm sorry that Bo could not be among us today. Uh, he brought a distinctive, almost uniquely humane and human perspective to conversations about health and health policy. Uh, our gathering here is diminished by his absence for that reason, but it's my hope that my remarks will resonate at least to some degree with the perspective he would have brought to this gathering. Uh, and in that way serve as a fitting, if perhaps very partial tribute to what he otherwise would have said. Uh, what I'd like to talk to you today is about two different stories about the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, or as it's more appropriately referred to, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, though the PP is often left out and largely forgotten from these conversations. Uh, the first of the stories is a public story, the story you hear about in the media, the story you hear about in political discourse, the second is a more hidden, but arguably more important story that I hope to unfold for you today. The public story runs something like this. Does government at state and federal levels have the capacity to create new institutions? These things we call health insurance exchanges, or in some context, marketplaces. Can government pull it off? Can it create it? And uh, as we saw with the snafus around the websites at federal and unfortunately Oregon levels, didn't look like it could for a while there, but now I think we're past those initial technical glitches. Second storyline, can we actually get more people enrolled? Can we expand coverage? And this is largely a story about counting bodies. Those of you who think back to the end of the 2000s, uh, 14, 2015 open enrollment period, the first open enrollment period. It was all about can, can the administration make that seven million count, the CDO projections for what would have been a successful launch to the health insurance exchanges. Now, the seven million was an entirely arbitrary number the CBO came up with, but that became the finish line. And if you remember, there was much anxiety and much relief when like a couple weeks by the, before the end of open enrollment, they nudged their way over that seven million mark. Third part of the story, and the one that has captured the greatest attention, is that health reform has become in ways that Paul already described, a partisan contest. Can the Democrats achieve it? Can the Republicans block it at state and federal level, in the courts, in the legislatures? And the question is, who will win? Now, that's the story you so often hear. But I think the story is both incomplete and importantly, a distortion of the kind of reality that health reform introduces at the level of individuals who are being enrolled in the plan. And it's to that more individual, more human level experience that I want to direct our attention. The first evidence to suspect that the simple story, the conventional story is not quite accurate, comes when you look at the level of enrollment that you actually observe. So this is a map of open enrollment after the second period of open enrollment, uh, the latest number is June 2015. Darker states have higher levels of enrollment, lighter states, lesser levels of enrollment. And so this is the number of people enrolled under the exchanges relative to what is the estimated target population based on income eligibility levels. You'll be happy to note 
that Oregon, despite its initial first year problems, has now made it into the second tier of medium blue states, still lagging a little behind the national average, but closing in on it. But what's remarkable are a couple of the anomalies you can see in this map. Notice Texas, a notably conservative state, is a darker color than New York, a notably liberal state. And look at the four states that are the darkest color on this map, the ones that are at 50 plus percent enrollment relative to their target populations. Vermont, Maine, Delaware, and Florida. Vermont and Delaware are classic blue states in a political sense. Democratic governors, democratically controlled legislatures. Maine and Florida, exactly the opposite. Republican governors, Republican control, and yet they're in the top four states in terms of penetration rates for their exchanges. So what could possibly be going on? It can't be the simple story of Republicans versus Democrats. Part of the story is that the simple model, what I'll call the field of dreams model for health exchanges, if you build it, they will come, turns out not to be accurate when it comes to insurance exchanges. Because it turns out you can build the best exchange in the world and it will still be hard for people on their own to figure out how to negotiate their way to insurance enrollment. So part of what we are going to see here is that this is a story not simply of government's capacity to build exchanges, but of a hybrid of government and nonprofit working together to actually get people enrolled. Now, why do you actually need that kind of hybrid? Because a lot of people have trouble figuring out what this new healthcare reform held for them in terms of prospects. A lot of people didn't understand the act. Multiple years after it's been enacted, people still don't understand what the PPACA holds in store for them. But even more so, people don't understand particularly if they have been long disenfranchised from insurance coverage, what it takes to get enrolled in insurance. What, what are the logistical challenges, what it means to become enrolled, even what it means to pay premiums on a regular basis. And so to bridge that gap between public knowledge and understanding from these disenfranchised populations, to get them both enrolled and stably enrolled in coverage, you need an assistant infrastructure. Now, the designers of the bill understood that. And so they built into the legislation the capacity to fund an infrastructure of what were called, what came to be called marketplace assisters. And those assisters in some parts were federally funded. They were called navigators. But in other cases, that fed, those federally funded assisters were supplemented in important ways from the private nonprofit sector. If you look at the total infrastructure so created, there were about 4,500 programs of marketplace assisters created around the country. Oregon had a number of them. They fell into three big categories. Navigators, which were the ones that were supported by federal and state exchange dollars. Federally qualified health centers, HRSA took about $250 million and designated that for assister money coming out of the community health centers. But then there was a big group of programs, the majority of programs, about 60% of the programs during the second enrollment period, which is where this, these numbers are from, who were called something kind of a bad acronym. They're called uh, Certified Application Counselors, or CACs. These programs were supported almost entirely by the nonprofit sector. Now, they were smaller than the other programs, so they enrolled about 30 to 40% of all the people who got enrolled through the exchanges, but they played a vital role supplementing the federally certified marketplace assisters. That was particularly true in the states that were run by the federal government, the federally facilitated marketplace. Now, exchanges around the country fall into three categories. State-based marketplaces, there are 17 of those run by the states, including Oregon. 
federally facilitated marketplaces, those that are basically run by the federal government, and then a handful of what are called federal state partnerships, where the federal government runs the exchange, but the state government runs the consumer-facing infrastructure, the marketplace, the system. Now notice, in the state-run exchanges and the partnership exchanges, you have about almost nine assisters per 10,000 enrolled people. In the federally facilitated marketplace, you have about half that many assisters. Why was it? Well, because there were a lot more federal marketplaces than the original designers had in mind. When the bill was cobbled together in Congress, everyone assumed that the conservative Republican states would never want the federal government running a program in their state. And so they assumed that they would be the first states to be run at the state level. But as you know, the subsequent partisan discord around the implementation of the bill meant that the federal government wound up running exchanges in about 33 different states. So that stretched the federal dollars a lot thinner than they were originally designed to cover and left a kind of inadequate level of federally funded support, which meant that the nonprofit sector and its capacity to step in and supplement the public sector in terms of marketplace assistance played a vital role. So Maine and Florida become the odd conservative success stories precisely because they had robust nonprofit sectors, foundation-funded assisters supporting the enrollment process. So that's the first part of the story. This isn't just a story of can government work, it's a story of whether the government can partner with the third sector, the philanthropic sector, to make this implementation work. But the second part of the story challenges the idea that healthcare reform implementation is just about counting bodies of people, formerly uninsured, who now have insurance coverage. Because it turns out that for all the goals we value, for all the reasons we want to expand insurance coverage, that is, to give people timely access to health care, to allow people to access health care in a way that does not undermine their financial security. It is not enough to give people insurance coverage. Now, there are a whole variety of reasons why it's not enough, particularly with the kind of policies people are buying on the exchanges but I'm gonna focus on one particular aspect of why it's not enough just to get people covered, which is that even if you get people covered, if they do not understand the provisions of what that insurance policy will cover, if they cannot anticipate what services will be covered and not covered under that policy, it is almost as bad as if they have no health insurance at all. Now, this should not come as a surprise to any of us, because most of us don't really understand our insurance policies. <laughs> and the truth is, those of us who think we do just haven't been sick enough to really understand the limitations <laughs> of those policies. Insurance is complicated. That's no, that's no diss to the insurance companies. Insurance is a complicated product filled with contingencies and coverage provisions, which are very hard to anticipate until you actually try to seek services. Uh, just prior to the, implement, to the enactment of, of the PPACA, I and some colleagues at Yale did a big national survey. It was a study of, of Americans' economic insecurity, but it included looking at their economic insecurity around healthcare-related issues. And so we surveyed people about their health coverage and healthcare experiences, and we found a variety of key findings. First, Two-thirds of all Americans who have insurance coverage, this is before the PPACA, were worried about not really being able to understand their insurance coverage. Now, if you look down that column, it's more with people who have more limited education. It's more with people who have individually purchased policies as opposed to employer-based policies because they don't have the human resource department at their employer helping them figure out what the coverage provisions are. So, most people kind of worry they don't quite get insurance. Second, if you don't know what's going to be covered, you are almost as likely to put off me medical care as if you don't have insurance at all. Almost 20% of all people surveyed in 2009 
So they put off medical care that they felt they needed because they weren't sure if their insurance policy would cover. Now, bear in mind, only 50% of people go to the doctor each year. So this is of the 50% who went to a doctor, about 40% of them put off care they otherwise would have needed because they were worried about not understanding their insurance policy. And again, here again, that is higher for people with individually purchased policies who don't have employer-based resources to help them interpret their coverage provision. So virtually half of the people who would have sought medical care under an individual policy didn't do so, at least in part, because they didn't understand what their insurance policies would cover. So it matters a lot, not just that people get covered, but they understand their coverage provisions enough to believe they can anticipate what that policy will pay for and what it will not. Now, that turned out to be a particularly big problem with the new populations being enrolled in the insurance exchanges. Because remember, these are the people who were often long-term uninsured. Not only could they not anticipate what a given policy would cover or not, they had a hard time in many cases understanding even the most basic concepts about what a deductible is or what it meant to be in or out of a network in terms of coverage for a particular provider. So when surveyed in 2015, the marketplace of sisters characterizing the populations they were surveying, three quarters of those programs said that most or nearly all of their clients didn't understand what a deductible was. So recognize what this means, that when people are coming to the assisters, they need a lot more help than just being told, here are the policies that are available to you, pick whichever one looks best. They need a lot of education, they need a lot of background coaching to be able to make sensible and plausible decisions under these different circumstances. That often can't be done in a single visit, that often requires an established ongoing relationship between the assisters and the consumers. Now, what that meant was that these marketplace assisters began doing a lot of things that people had not anticipated they were going to do. So this is data from a Kaiser Family Foundation survey of marketplace assister programs during the first open enrollment period. You can see down that first column, it talks about all the different things the programs reported doing. In the right-hand column, which of these things made it into their top three? Which were part of their primary activities of what they were doing? And let me call attention to a particular one of these different activities. It turns out that Marketplace assisters were not simply helping people to enroll, but they were very often being involved in what was called post-enrollment problems. After you get people insurance coverage, how do you help them negotiate and understand what their insurance policy will actually pay for and what it won't? How do you get them to figure out how to interact with their insurance company to get questions answered? How do you get them to be informed consumers to actually know what they're being protected for and what not. Almost 80% of these marketplace assisters were involved in post-enrollment problems. Almost 20% of their programs had those post-enrollment activities among the top three things they did with their clients. Now, what did that look like in terms of more detail? This is the data from the most recent survey during the second enrollment period, and you can see it involved a whole variety of different activities. Some of them are very mundane, like the person never got their insurance card and they, they didn't know how to access care, so it was solving problems like that. But many others were about problems involving what was covered, what wasn't covered, people thinking they joined the wrong plan when they actually figured out what the coverage limitations were, people deciding they'd been in the wrong, they'd chosen the wrong plan because they discovered their doctor who they'd been going to was not covered because they didn't really understand the network provisions. There are a whole variety of different factors that marketplace assisters become involved with on a continuing basis 
to help people newly enrolled in the exchanges actually be able to negotiate access to care and understand those coverage provisions. So marketplace assisters were massively involved in this. Those 4,500 programs, the roughly 25,000 FTEs who are part of the marketplace assister infrastructure were substantially involved in these long-term relationships with clients, building this kind of support in education. There's just one problem with this picture. This kind of marketplace involvement for the assisters is illegal under federal law. Ooh, that's not good. So why would that be? Well, it's illegal because there was supposed to be a second part of consumer assistance that was supposed to supplement the marketplace assistance. These were called consumer assistance programs. They are also authorized under the PPACA. Every state is supposed to have a consumer assistance. Consumer assistance programs, or CAPs as they are referred to, are supposed to pick up where the marketplace assisters, the navigators, leave off. Navigators were supposed to help people choose. CAP programs helped them once they had become enrolled. The problem was that the PPACA delegated the authority to run CAPs to state governments. Now, that's not surprising. State governments have always regulated health insurance in the US. So it made sense at some level to delegate that authority. But as the implementation of the PPACA became more and more politically contentious, states became less and less willing to actually take on this role. So if you look at this map, the states that are in the light color, the beige color, did not accept, what happened was under the ACA, uh, the federal government was giving grants to the states to help them either set up their caps or if they already had consumer assistance programs to increase their capacity. And so there were a series of grants that went from DC to the states. The beige states never even bothered to apply for a grant because they didn't want to run this damn Obamacare thing. So they never participated from the start. The two blue states, Wisconsin and Ohio, they, they applied for a grant and they accepted a grant, but then they were elected Republican governors in 2012. And they said, oh, we don't want this damn Obamacare money, we're gonna give it back. Scott Walker, newly elected as governor of Wisconsin, had the particularly appealing comment where he said, well, we don't need this federal money because no one in Wisconsin has problems with insurance. <laughs> a, a comment that caused even insurance executives in that state to roll their eyes. Uh, the states that are in green accepted one round of grants. The states that are in red accepted two rounds of grants. You can see the number of states gets smaller and smaller the more grants there were. At this point, circa 2015, we're down to, depending on how you count, 12 to 14 states that have active consumer assistance programs going. All right, so this is a big problem, right? One vital part of the consumer support infrastructure is missing in two thirds of the states in the country. Now, the marketplace assisters are trying to step in, but they have to step in, A, without the resources to do this job of post-enrollment assistance, B, without the training to know what they're doing. They're not trained the way the consumer assistance programs were and how to advocate on patients' behalf with insurance companies. And C, as I mentioned earlier, they're in violation of federal law. Big problems. Now, of course, all these states are also in violation of federal law because they're not running CAP programs. But we have a real conundrum given the political contentions that exist around the program. That brings us to our third and final aspect of this hitherto hidden story about implementation of healthcare reform, which is that under the circumstances I have just described, given the importance of people understanding what insurance means for them, not simply to get coverage, given the somewhat inconsistent capacity of the state consumer assistance infrastructure to help them with this, Arguably, 
we really need to rethink what we're doing in terms of supporting consumers as they enter the healthcare marketplace. States have already begun to do this in various ways, but inconsistently given the varied circumstances that I just described. Arguably, there are two key pieces to this rethinking. First, marketplace assisters had been originally conceived to be what I'll call transactional assistance, to help people figure out how to get enrolled and then say goodbye to them, refer them on to consumer assistance programs. In the absence of consumer assistance programs in those states, instead, the marketplace assisters, the navigators, the CACs, the FQHC navigator equivalents, all those roles take on a very different set of aspirations. They're not just there to help people sign up. They become a source of continued relationship, continued connection, continued source of education and assistance for individuals who are in the marketplace. That's a very different kind of role. It requires a kind of trust building. It requires a kind of sustained support. It requires a very different set of relationships between the clients and those who are providing assistance. Second, in the absence or the very partial implementation of this form of consumer support, we have we need other ways of monitoring how well these new exchanges are actually performing from the consumer's perspective. The CAPs were supposed to be not simply assisting individuals who had problems with their insurance. They were supposed to be systematically collecting information on how well the marketplaces were working. But since caps don't exist in two thirds of the country, we've got a big gap in understanding how well people are actually doing under these new insurance arrangements. So we need to have other ways of regularly assessing that kind of experience. What could we be looking for? What are the options in terms of trying to better learn from consumer experience? Well, there are a series of different options that we have available. Uh, they fall into basically a two by two matrix. First, how often do you want to try to collect information from consumers? Do you do it yearly, every six months? Do you do it on a kind of periodic and regular basis? Or do you do it when they are having a problem, when they can't get care that they think they can need? Second, what kinds of information are you trying to collect? Are you gonna to try to measure things in a quantifiable way? Or do you basically want to collect qualitative accounts? patient stories, patient narratives about what are happening to them. When you cross that two by two matrix, you wind up with four types of patient reported information you might strive for. The upper left hand quadrant, the patient experience surveys, involve the things like the CAP survey that Meredith referred to earlier that Paul's been working on for 20 years. The bottom right hand quadrant involves things like grievances and complaints. Those were the things the CAP programs were supposed to be collecting and summarizing on a system level basis. But again, we're missing the CAPs in two thirds of the states. Patient reported outcome measures, the lower left hand quadrant, are the kinds of things that people would report on a regular basis about how well they are doing by way of their health and health care. Those are gradually being infused into the healthcare system, but still remain very partial. It's the upper right hand quadrant that I want to call our attention to though, which is the capacity we have to elicit, that is systematically collect patient narratives on their access and quality of care, to hear from them stories about how they are doing in terms of being able to get care in a needed and timely way. It turns out that Doing this kind of collection of elicited patient narratives is a challenging task, a lot more challenging than most people recognize. Uh, over the past few years, I and a series of colleagues have been involved in developing a strategy for being able to do this. We just published last month in the New England Journal a kind of roadmap for how this might be accomplished. We can talk about the details of that more in detail. It involves really laying out the criteria of what a good patient narrative actually is. 
And how would you know if you're able to collect that on a systematic basis from a broad cross-section of the patient population? So where does this leave us? In conclusion, drawing on this hitherto hidden story of how health reform implementation is touching individuals, I believe we have the building blocks toward building a new, different story of how health reform and indeed the healthcare system ought to work by way of the patient experience. First, we need to understand that this is not simply about getting people enrolled. It's about increasing people's understanding and engagement with both their insurance and the healthcare system being delivered. That's a very different task and requires very different resources to accomplish. Second, it is not something that's produced by one-off transactions. You can enroll someone in a health plan and then say goodbye to them. If you really want them to be able to understand their policies and use their health care well, you need to have ongoing relationships between consumers and the assistance infrastructure designed to help them do that. And third, we really need to listen to experiences at the patient level. We need to collect both qualitative and quantitative data from a cross-section of patient experience so we can really tell who is being benefited and who is not. We are very partially there right now. We have a long way to go to get this new story fully told. Thank you. All right, questions, comments? Go to the mic. You're on. Sorry, Excellent question, uh, just to repeat to make sure everyone heard. So the question is, do you want to collect narratives just from the patients or also from the assisters? There is a national website called In the Loop, which is run by a consumer advocacy group called Community Catalyst that I, I'm on the board of, which does collect these kind of uh, assister-based narratives and feeds them back to other assisters to help them improve things. We are still working on the best ways of taking patient narratives and aggregating them in ways that A, they can be fed back to clinicians so they can benefit from learning more about patient experience. B, they can be put on public reporting websites so people can compare across health systems and healthcare providers in terms of those experiences. But third, and most importantly from a policy making perspective, so you can aggregate them up and use them like kind of canaries in the mine shaft to warn you when there are problems developing in the system for particular populations. That's a work in progress and we can talk more about it later. Uh, yeah, name, please. Yes, and so this is, this is the, the, the paradox of insurance, right? Until people really need insurance coverage for expensive, complicated conditions, insurance looks good, right? So remember when Paul was talking earlier about how people were upset because they were paying more for their health insurance under the PPACA? That's because the act basically made illegal a set of crappy insurance policies that didn't actually cover anything. And now they have to actually buy real insurance policies. But they didn't know they had crappy insurance policies because until they got sick, they felt they were insured, right? So you only really learn about the limitations of insurance from talking to sick people, not from talking to the average enrolled person. Yeah, Paul, what I was Now 
That's great. And obviously, Oregon has been kind of way ahead of most parts of the country, save possibly New York, in using community health workers. And so you guys are kind of at the forefront in using this as an institutional reform. To my knowledge, there have been no studies that have tried to collect the experience of community health workers in a systematic way. There's a close analog in, in the so-called cancer navigator programs where there have been some efforts to collect information from those navigators about care, but I don't think we know very much about how best to do it with community health workers. I think it's a great idea, we just don't know how to do it yet. Yeah, I think, I think that's one big issue. I think you're very right that this is a burden that falls on the primary care physicians in the absence of effective CAP programs. The problem is not all physicians are equally well equipped to fulfill that role, not are equally well trained, not all have enough time to play that kind of advocacy role. When you actually survey physicians, about a third of them are eager to be advocates in this way, about two thirds are not because they feel otherwise too time conflicted. So it's a tough ask to ask primary care doctors to take this on. Some will, not everyone will. Yeah, the, I mean, Oregon is in this weird case of they are a state-run exchange, but they are what's called a federally supported state-run exchange, which means you operate under federal guidelines for those what plans have to do and what they don't have to do. In the 14 states that are purely federally administered exchanges, some states have been very aggressive about exactly those kinds of coverage provisions. The federal government has not been because they're trying to implement across the country in places where there's a lot of hostility. And so they're just trying to get people enrolled. But I think it's a big problem. And I think we could look to the 14 state administered exchanges for some, some good lessons in how best to do that. One more. That's a very good question. Uh, it depends a lot on, on what constitutes a health plan, obviously. If we're talking about Kaiser as a health plan, they have a very different capacity to reach out and educate enrollees than if we're talking about some of the state-run ex uh, exchange policies done by Aetna or by Humana, right? And so one of the things, I did a study on this about a decade ago that looked at when people had access problems, would they complain to their health plan? Would they give voice to it? And there was a huge difference in terms of how many people would give voice to the health plan when they had access problems. The single best predictor was whether they had a good relationship with their health plan, whether they saw the health plan as being on their side or being a kind of opponent and antagonist. So the insurers who just didn't want to hear complaints could just be a little hostile and people wouldn't complain to them. And so you had this big divide between the quote good guy plans, the white hat plans, and the less good guy plans and big differences in voice across those two types. All right, good, thank you guys.